guys invited friends, welcome to MTN, welcome to Ghana. This is a special conversation with the group CEO of MTN, Ralph Mupita, who is in Ghana for an official working visit. We are privileged to have a brief chat with him on a number of key issues. Ralph, it's good to have you. Good afternoon. No, thank you so much and uh, appreciate the opportunity to, um, to be in the market. Um, you know, it's always um, the most fulfilling part of the job is to really see the uh, connectivity between our business and the customers and society that we serve. And uh, Ghana is a very really favorite place of mine, but don't have all the other markets that I say that. But uh, I really enjoy coming here. I always feel at home here. Fantastic. So before we get into the interview, just to uh, explain some of the constraints we have. So my name is Bernard Avle, by the way, a journalist at City FM and City TV here in Ghana. I have some of our best colleagues from all the major media houses here. I have friends from the National Daily Graphic. Uh, we have the Finder newspaper. We have TV3. We have Joy FM. We have Adom FM. And we also have the Economy Times journalists here. We've been given an hour to have a conversation. I will not be greedy. I'll spend the first probably 20 minutes uh, asking a few quick questions. We'll take a couple of questions from the floor from colleague journalists, and then we'll come back and wrap up the conversation. As you would know, a visit like this is very tightly scheduled. He's had many meetings, and he's given the media an hour. We'll make the most of it. Thank you so much for joining us. Ralph, thank you. So just to set the ball rolling, this is your third time in Ghana this year. I don't understand how a busy man like you would be in Ghana for the third time in less than six months. <laughs> No, thanks very much for that. Yes, it's my third time uh, in the last um, almost five months. Uh, there's always good reason to be here, but it's generally for very positive reasons. Um, you touched on something about, uh, um, you know, the relationship between the land of my birth and Ghana. Um, yeah, I was born in Zimbabwe. Uh, I was born in, uh, in what is today Harare, but I grew up in my childhood and uh, the time when uh, Sally Hafron, Sally Mugabe, was the first lady. So you grew up in, always influenced by issues Ghanaian. And the uh, first time I heard of Akwaba was when I was a, a, a child living in, uh, actually in Harare. Wow. So yeah, many, many, many reasons. I mean, to your point specifically, why here? Um, we always have a continuous program of visiting kind of our priority markets for sure. Ghana being the third largest market within the MTN portfolio, there's always good reason to be here. But we feel that this time round, it's particularly important to come and really understand what is going on um, in the broader uh, Ghanaian society, occasioned by the challenges that we're seeing more globally. There's a lot that's happening globally. We thought we had exited COVID and the conditions that COVID created, and we're in the year, and other things have happened. So for us, in many respects, I'm here with my group chairman, it's part of just being on the ground, talking to stakeholders, talking to journalists, community as well, so that we uh, are better informed about what's happening and what role we can play as, as the group to support socioeconomic progress uh, of Ghana. You, you mentioned COVID, which is interesting because you were announced as group CEO August 2020, which is right in the middle of a global pandemic. That's right. Now you have the three Cs, COVID or post-COVID, conflict and climate, complicating how the world works. How must it be for you for the past two and a half years just being in the middle of this maelstrom? Yeah, it's been for me the same as it's been for everybody, I would presume, uh, which is being, um, having to think through what the interaction of all these forces mean and trying to see how it will evolve and progress. Um, I don't think we're post-COVID. I know we hear a lot of narrative that we're post-COVID. I mean, the virus has the capacity to mutate. Um, it just has moved from Delta to Omicron or Omicron variants, which are more benign, but you can't predict the path of uh, viruses. So um, I would like to think that we are behind the hard lockdown arrangements of COVID because we have very effective vaccines that have been developed and are available. Yes, we've had our challenges across markets to access those vaccines, but I'd argue that on COVID, yes, we are behind it, but we need to maintain our vigilance uh, such that if another variant came along. But um, to your point, what we're now dealing with, and these things all interact, uh, is the conflict, the Ukraine-Russia war. Um, and I think what has surprised many, 
and it's something that we need to think about as Africans, is how much dependency on food, uh, particularly wheat and sunflower, we've had as Africans who have 70% of all um, available uncultivated arable land is on the African continent, yet we're importing so much. Wheat, sunflower oil, um, a country like Sudan where we operate in, 80% uh, of wheat comes from those two countries. So conflict has um, driven a lot of shocks um, into um, what was already a rising inflation environment, uh, food and energy prices in particular, uh, where we're, we're most impacted. Um, and I think what we're now seeing as a consequence of that is that we are facing potentially a global recession. Mm. And um, even the US is surprised by the level of inflation. So the conflict has had manifested itself globally and I think the most the biggest impact is going to be in emerging markets such as the ones we operate in, in uh, M, uh, as MTN. Ghana would also be affected. Um, so that's on the seaside. And the climate change is linked to the conflict because all of a sudden Russian gas and oil uh, sanctions are coming up. So there's almost a little bit of a retroactive response back to using lots of coal uh, and looking at using to, to tapping resources uh, in terms of oil and gas in other markets. Yeah. So I think we're going to see a bit of a challenge on the progress towards net zero. There was a view that while a lot of economies and companies struggled during COVID, lost incomes, Ghana's GDP growth record low, a few organizations, the Zooms of this world and the MTNs did very well. In fact, your 2021 um, financial results showed, quote, a growing strong revenue and strong financials in a tough macro environment. So two questions there. Is it that your business managed to profit from people's pain? Or was it just a question of reaction to a need? How did you do so well when everybody else was struggling so bad? Yeah, it's a great question. And we often get asked that question from time to time. Um, I would start off by saying that um, the telecommunication industry is a very capital intensive business. We have to put the capital, uh, you know, consistently every single year. We're putting, you know, enormous amount of capital to sustain our networks and make sure our networks are high quality. So we've been on this path for many, many years of, you know, investing in the network. You know, making sure that we are doing 3G, 4G pop coverage, covering the urban areas, covering the rural areas. So that investment has been made for multiple years, and in many respects. Um, I would argue it was quite fortuitous that ourselves and, and maybe other market participants had taken the view that says the future of the global economy, including ours, is going to be really, really impacted by the digital economy. Mm. So we saw that and we said that's a 10, 20, 30 year uh, sectoral trend. So we must invest into the trend. So what then happened in the pandemic is that we had largely, and I'll come back to the point about largely, we had largely built our network sufficiently to enable people to go and work from home and therefore carry on the economic activity. Um, and um, yes, whilst other businesses were, had to, uh, were impacted by uh, the, um, the COVID lockdowns, hospitality, any business that had, uh, was impacted by social distancing, restaurants, etc. We, in many respects, having invested early, enabled the economies to carry on. And, uh, and we've also been managing our expenses very well. We give Salon a hard time about expenditure. So yes, there's a confluence of things that gave us good results, but it wasn't a short-term thing. That investment forms part of Ghana's uh, gross uh, capital formation. Um, so it's a contribution to the economic uh, sustainability of the... Uh, so we don't see it as like a windfall thing. You must understand that also data prices generally come down, generally come down if you look at our effective rate per gigabyte. Um, but we also understand our role in society more deeply. And hence, the decision we took to say, look, we are through COVID, let's do two things. One is, let's provide vaccines. Uh, we're taking $25 million of our own shareholder capital. And because we have this vaccine equity issue, we as MTN are going to put up our hand. Uh, so that's one thing. 
The second is we zero rated many sites and services, mobile money, voice zero rating, we zero rated for schools and other uh, critical services. Um, that's another action that we took mindful. So in many respects, um, but I think there is a circular trend where you're seeing services become a bigger part of any advanced economy. So we are kind of caught up in that trend, um, um, if that makes sense. Ralph, one of the reasons why the company did very well on the continent last time around, mm. in spite of all the investments you talk about, was the low inflation environment. Yeah. As we speak, that's gone through the roof. Mm. Inflation in Ghana is close to 24%. Mm. In Cote d'Ivoire, it's near 16 In Nigeria, as well, above 14 mm. In a high inflation environment, there's a fear that you're not going to make that much money and your shareholders are expecting so much. So is there a fear that with the volatility in the macro environment, your investment into new broadband, new fiber and stuff like this is going to suffer because the financial will not, good, will not look good because of the inflationary environment we're seeing all over the continent? A great question again. Um, I mean, we take a view as the MTN group that we're in it for the long haul. You know, the, the position that we have uh, as the MTN group uh, is to develop digital solutions for Africa's progress. This is a multi-year, long-term project that we need to sustain. You know, when I, people like myself get appointed into these roles, what the board and the shareholders want to know is that we have somebody and a team of people who are able to uh, build a long-term sustainable business. And you will ride through cycles. There are, sick, uh, there are cycles of inflation, currency devaluation, etc. So the, the view we take right now is, yes, you know, inflation impacts everything. Um, and um, not just our business model, but pretty much every single business model. I'm not sure there's a, uh, maybe parts of life insurance benefit from uh, um, you know, rising inflation positively. Maybe some banks or parts of banks do that. But if we're building a long-term business you know, that needs to be sustainable 10, 15 years out, we have to have a view that we can ride through this. And yes, it might not be cyclical, as some of the central banks might have thought two years ago about that inflation is transitory. It seems that it's here for a period of time. Certainly the conventional wisdom is inflation in developed markets and emerging markets will be sustained relatively high you know, over a, you know, a two-year period, um, if not a little bit longer. So we do need to prepare ourselves for a world of higher inflation and take the actions as the private sector, working with the public sector, to say how do we immunize our people the best possible way uh, from it. So yes, in the short term, you know, does it have impacts on the share price? Um, you know, quite likely. But you know, Salom, people like myself, you know, we, don't, we need to manage the short term but we need to build a business for the long term. So to your question about investment, the current uh, conditions do not um, reduce our appetite to invest. Um, we want to have a sustained investment program so that in a market like Ghana, that every Ghanaian has the capacity to enjoy the benefits of a modern connected life. We're not changing that view. So if we are true to that vision, we must sustain the capex. Yes, there may be some you know, margin pressure here and there, but we will figure it out. We'll find more efficiencies. Um, so we're not going to uh, reduce the level of investment. Whatever investment commitments we've made, and we've made many commitments to stakeholders here, we are going to meet those uh, to ensure that we build the digital infrastructure uh, for the progress uh, of Ghanaians, and to make sure that we align ourselves to nation state programs like the Ghana Cares program, we have a very important role to play. So um, we, we, we see ourselves as partners uh, for progress, and we will work with the government uh, to figure out some of these challenges. This is a special time with Ralph Mupita, group CEO of MTN. He's in Ghana, officially for the third time this year, and we're having a chat with him. My name is Bernard Avle. I have colleagues from the media who will join me soon. Colleagues, I'm, I want to now come down to Ghana specific questions briefly and then I'll come to you. Please bear with me. I have a couple of Ghana-specific questions for you, Ralph. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about the macro environment. One of the basic criticisms Selom gets when you are not here is that the company he works for is part of the reason why our currency does so poorly. Because when the city depreciates, some people look at it as a cyclical thing. So somewhere around February, March, 
when profits have to be repatriated, <laughs> the city tanks. And he's always getting pressure for that. I can imagine it was an issue that was raised in some of your meetings. What's your general view about that? You're in many countries, 700 million customers in over 20 countries. Clearly, there are nuances to countries. But for Ghana, the exchange rate is one of the things we can't really seem to figure out. What's your comment about MTN's role in that? And is there any commitment to what to do to help us address this? Yeah, well, for sure. I mean, we've got a, a, a very special business uh, in Ghana. Um, and, and in many respects, one of the reasons I keep coming back often is, you know, you learn from what's happening in Ghana uh, and you go to other markets and try and replicate as much as you can. Uh, because Ghana is a, a special uh, business, uh, a special jewel within the MTN group. Um, so we're not oblivious to the fact that um, we have a big business and that you know, any dividend and capital repatriations you know, can have some uh, impact. I wouldn't want to say it's all about MTN. There's several multinationals that are here. I mean, even our own local demands for CapEx, you know, we need to buy radios uh, and we need to get them from China. I mean, we basically get radios for our uh, network from ZTE or Huawei or Ericsson for that matter. So um, we, we, we're sensitive to that issue. But we have ongoing discuss discussions with the Bank of Ghana to ensure that we do not repatriate in a way that is, um, that is disturbing um, you know, to the currency. Uh, you're right, we make profits um, and we need to ultimately have some of that capital distributed to our shareholders. Um, but um, you know, I, I wouldn't say the burden is really on Salom uh, you know, for, 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 for that. Um, you know, sometimes you know, the global macro issues are more a driver of the currency and um, yeah, we repatriate capital maybe twice a year, so we can't be, you can't beat up Salom for that. But I know where your question Fair is enough. coming the, from. The second big issue is the e levy and yeah. to frame it properly, again, when I look at your 2021 results, your growth in voice was just 5.2%, data 36.5%, fintech 30.9%, digital 22.8%. So clearly, the fintech digital area is very key to the company's future. Here in Ghana, following the controversial e levy passage, we've seen a drop in the MTN share price by 18% compared to January. Obviously, it must be a big concern for you. What are your thoughts around that e levy and the prospects for growth, what it means for the company's prospects for growth? Yeah, firstly, I just want to recognize um, the, the enormous challenge and burden that the government and the Ministry of Finance has to kind of balance the budget in such a macro. I mean, the, the role that uh, Minister Ken has is, is one of the most difficult, and we need to be supportive uh, to the challenges. If I were in his shoes uh, and looking to balance the books, I would look everywhere. And he has done that, and I think uh, you know, a lot of respect for the minister in terms of how he's tried to, uh, you know, to balance it. And I think in my meetings with him, he often uses a phrase called burden sharing. I don't know if that's a specific Ghanaian framing, but I first heard it from him. You guys are familiar with that. And, and, and just to give everybody a perspective, there's a lot of burden sharing in other markets as well. So the, the, the beauty of being in a group, you see things many a times. So I think there's an enormous burden sharing exercise that's needed more broadly. Coming back to the specifics of the e-levy, which is seen as part of solving the burden sharing, I mean, it's... Um, it's, it's, it's very early days for us to comment. We are two and a half weeks into implementing the first phase. Uh, we've, been, we've experienced other um, kind of mo mobile money taxes in markets such as Uganda. Uh, you know, you go to Benin, we go to Cameroon. So we've seen and we have a, and we, we're being very constructive. I know Salom uh, you know, is constant uh, in touch with the various authorities of how it's progressing. But I think that the main thing is to say again, um, we, at the group level, you've got to also obsess with the medium to long term. Um, and the medium to long term says the following, is that um, the reason you see digital payments rising is that actually we are solving the problem of financial inclusion. Um, the traditional banking systems, and I come from the financial services sector, <laughs> I probably have more credibility coming from there than telecommunications. But the, one of the things that traditional banking and insurance um, systems did not have the capillarity of going very deep and driving financial inclusion just because of their cost structures. 
So I think there is a structural medium to long term view where the economy shifts towards more services and the digital ecosystem plays a bigger role. I think in time you'll see um, that, um, you know, particularly if we're able to really drive regional integration from an AU perspective, that the digital ecosystem. So there's a balancing here that needs to be carefully thought of around the fiscus, around the, the in investment in the digital ecosystem. What we are certainly doing as MTN, both at the group level and in Ghana, is we are going to continue investing in driving a, an expansion of the digital ecosystem to enable e-commerce, to, en to enable payments. We'll have some short-term pressures on revenue for sure. But we, you've got to look around the corner. You've got to look over the hill to say what is the direction of travel. The direction of travel is you know, deepening uh, payments, e-commerce, uh, bank tech, insure tech. Those verticals are the future of what will sustain particularly small medium enterprises um, who need very specific situations to make their businesses successful. And so, you know, the e-levy, it's, it's, as I said, it's early days. You know, if you ask me the question in six months' time, I'll have more data and I can um, comment more authoritatively. Let's just wrap it up with a final question. You said Ghana was the crown in the jewel, third largest market. I wonder why. Is it because we seem to be ahead on the fintech side? Because when we scan the sub-region, you seem to be a bit behind in Nigeria when it comes to some of the licenses for mobile. And it's not just MTN. It's generally the market seems to be more bank-driven. Mm -hmm. Ghana appears more fintech telco-driven on the mobile financial services side. Just walk us briefly through what it is about the Ghana market that excites you. And in doing so, also give us some insights into MTN's plans for, like, say, a bank in the future and the role Ghana has to play in there. It's a lot of things into one question <laughs> because my colleagues are looking at me. They want to come in, so I'm bundling everything. So the Ghana-Nigeria relativity, the, the regulatory environment, then the issue of the MTN bank, where it's headed, and Ghana's role in all of that. Yeah, I mean, um, yesterday we were... Um, as part of our nation state visits, uh, seeing uh, priority stakeholders, we're in uh, Abuja for the launch of our payment services banking license. So uh, we now have a, a, a mobile money business of, uh, with the right license regime now, and we want to thank uh, the authorities there for enabling it, uh, you know, specifically the Central Bank of Nigeria. So there's a catch up, and actually we had a discussion with the governor. We said, you know, um, Nigeria's financial inclusion is a 64, um, you know, can you guys get it to into the 80s over the next seven months? So it's a big task. So uh, you're right that uh, you know Ghana in that specific area, you know, it, it is leading. I mean, what I would say around you know our longer-term ambitions, and I'm a less of authority than Salom here, who is uh, more authoritative on this. But what I would say is that you know our amb ambitions on driving and supporting financial inclusion are not diminished at all. In fact, we are more resolute around the investment and bringing partnerships that help us to scale and enable the lady, I always say I use the story, there's a lady in Kumasi who is making baskets as an example. Why should Ghana be her market? Why not the world? Why can we not create the apps and the logistics infrastructure such that she on her phone can sell those baskets to people in South Africa? to people in the US, because that is the direction of travel. And we want to participate in that. And um, in, a, in terms of a banking license, I think we, 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 we're quite happy with the, the e-money license that we have right now. But if ever a time came where we wanted to have a different kind of license regime, um, we would obviously talk to the authorities, the Bank of Ghana, and explain the reason why. Um, you know, that time may well come, but it's not something that is exercising our minds now. But our commitment to driving financial inclusion remains undiminished. And in fact, we're more excited. And we are talking to the stakeholders um, about, uh, and then I touch on your third question, what excites us about uh, Ghana, is we are talking about to the authorities about you know, what, are, what is the scope of creating Silicon Valleys in places like Ghana, okay? I mean, I travel a lot, and I was in the Seattle head office, and I went, sorry, I was in this, Seattle head office for, of uh, Microsoft. Um, and you see around the campus just all these uh, Africans 
cloud engineers. Mm -hmm. And you think, but these people, you ask them, they're first generation Africans. That means they, 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 they grew up in Accra, they grew up um, in Abidjan. Um, why don't we solve these things? Uh, so what excites me about Ghana is, A, it's a vibrant uh, democracy, and, and uh, don't underestimate the importance of vibrant democracies. You're seeing you know, democracy go the other way in parts of the world. Um, that democracy must always be something that is um, cherished and nourished. Um, and the robustness and the noisiness of a democracy is not something to frown upon, but actually to, to seek um, you know, good in that. The second is, it's, there's a lot of vibrancy around the talent and the entrepreneurship of the people. You know, Ghana has our best merchant ecosystem when we look around our fintech businesses. It, it, it is just a show of just the entrepreneurial zeal and ability and, um, and new cases, solutions to problems. We see a lot here. Um, so, and it's, it's not just really about the fintech business, but more broadly about how do we run our business. Now, when I finish this interview, I'm gonna have you know, the other operations phoning me, but Ralph, you are saying Ghana is the jewel. <laughs> what about us? And I'll tell them the same thing, that you also are jewels. So, I mean, you know, we are super, super, super uh, encouraged. We understand that um, there are some, you know, short-term challenges um, that are hitting everybody. It's not just a Ghanaian dynamic, it's South Africa, it's Nigeria, it's Cote d'Ivoire, it's the developed markets. We're dealing with 9% inflation in the US. In the Eurozone, similar level. But as Africans, we'll get through this. And I think one of the things which we haven't spoken about that I think is going to be something, whenever you're in a crisis, you must say, what is the silver lining here? I think for the African continent, the silver lining here is, you know, can we think about creating a digital unified marketplace? Mm -hmm. And I come back to that point about the lady in Kumasu can sell her basket in uh, Lusaka. So there's a real opportunity here to shape our own futures and solve our own uh, challenges. Brilliant, this is still our time with MTN. I want to revert to my colleagues, Elvis Dakum is with the Finder newspaper, he uh, raised his hand. So the plan, would you take, um, is it one question per time? Is that okay? We can take two, two. two at a time. So, uh, so I'll start with Elvis and then um, um, George for the first round, thank you. Elvis. I write for the final newspaper. For the telecoms, spectrum is like liquidity for the telecom company. I want you to do, give me an assessment of the procedures and processes that telcos have to go through to get access to spectrum in Ghana compared to other markets that you operate. And, and secondly, when you talk about us looking at creating this digital market and all that, it means that governments will also have to invest a lot in the space. Looking at the market where you operate, what has been the investment in the digital space? For instance, looking at Ghana, where we say we are doing a digitization agenda compared to where you operate. How will you compare Ghana to those countries? Thank you very much. Thank you, Elvis. Let's take George from Multimedia Group. Yeah. My name is George, we have Joy FM. Um, the first one has to do with um, the implementation of the SMP and how that is going to impact the operations of MTN Ghana going forward. I know that you have been able to convince shareholders and investors across us this is going to be your projected growth and everything. With the application of the implementation of this by the regulators, how do you see the growth being impacted? And are you going to see that same level of commitment from investors and shareholders now that the growth could be impacted because of regulators impacting or influencing or maybe applying these things and how it's going to impact the group? So my question is that mm. with the regulators applying these uh, new regulations, do you think that it's going to impact your ability mm. to raise fresh capital to do certain business mm. in the group and in Ghana? Because before that, we knew where the business was going, i.e. market share and certain services, and how that could impact on your growth as well. Thank you. Second one, quick one, has to but do with them. 
It's, 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 because of it's more than one, it will confuse. So yeah, let's take yeah, it, let's do it one question per person, then we can come back. So there's the uh, question on the spectrum, yeah. and then the PSMP, so that he doesn't lose track. Thank you. Yeah, I, I should have brought a notebook here, because I was saying uh, my, the ability to capture all these questions. So let's start with the spectrum. No, look, I mean, we're very comfortable in the way that we've been um, securing spectrum within the Ghana market. And uh, actually, it's a matter that we, we are very thankful uh, in our discussions with the Minister of Communications, Honourable Minister has been very supportive for us in terms of getting, you know, um, you know, bands of spectrum with a look forward positioning. So, um, in Ghana is a market, uh, you know, where we really haven't had any issues. I mean, like any operators, you never have enough spectrum. <laughs> There's no operator that will tell you we've got enough spectrum. And so we're looking forward now to the evolution, not just from 3G to 4G, but uh, 4G to 5G. So the discussions we would like to be having ongoing would be ones that are what is the quantum and what are the bands of spectrum that we need going forward. Into the future, the 2600 band becomes more important. The 3500 band, which is the anchor band for 5G, where you basically need like 100 megahertz of contiguous spectrum become important. So th those, that's the nature of the conversations and we are for sure, continuously having those um, with the authorities, the minister, and with the NCA. So, um, and when we compare processes, um, you know, the processes are as good as in, 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 in most markets. We, we used to have a very difficult process in a market like South Africa where it took 15 years to get multi-band spectrum out. And, you know, you know, we thank the minister there as well for pushing ahead and getting you know, spectrum out. Now we have another 100 megahertz of multi-band spectrum. But in Ghana, I think you know, things in benchmarks uh, well. On the point around the investment, I mean, one needs to take a point of view on saying, if governments are constrained from a capital point of view, you can actually create policies to crowd in the private sector, such as companies like MTN, to build the digital infrastructure. Um, it's part of the, the, this point of burden sharing is, you know, can governments build the digital infrastructure? Globally, it's not happening anywhere. You go to the US, you've got these mobile networks, your Verizons, um, you know, your AT&Ts, uh, you go to the UK. So the build out of digital infrastructure is, a, is, uh, is something governments uh, can, cre can create the right incentive and regulatory environments to enable private sector, because the global markets are awash with capital that would seek to invest in these op opportunities. And I think what you will see a lot more is that um, the build of infrastructure, whether it's fiber, whether it's data centers, is gonna be done by special, uh, specialists and scale businesses that um, you know, uh, are willing to take a long-term view of that infrastructure build. So I would put a position out there that says, uh, rather than burden the government to invest there, where they should be using their resource for socioeconomic projects, let the private sector come in because they know what they're doing. On SMP, I mean, we've been living with the SMP regime for several years now. We are SMP in Nigeria for voice. So it is something that we've learned and got accustomed to. Um, you know, shareholders can take a view. Um, I think the view that's been taken, um, you know, before the kind of global shocks that we've seen, which are affecting all equity markets, to be frank, um, is that the share price has been rising up uh, in an environment where we've had SMP regulations. We've implemented three of those SMP, and we've taken one uh, set of SMP uh, recommendations and implemented it ourselves, national roaming. We have announced that we got a national roaming deal with Vodafone in Ghana, uh, which we're moving into POC and ultimately look to roll out nationwide. Because as you move from 4G to 5G in particular, um, the mobile business becomes a lot more fixed uh, it sounds almost like a contradictory statement that so mobile becomes fixed because you have to invest heavily in the fiberization of your networks, data centers become important and, and so forth. So we've gone ahead and we said we think for the sustainability of the industry, national roaming is needed and we will volunteer ourselves to do deals with uh, the number two and number three. And, and we have the, 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 the experience in markets like South Africa where we also have a national roaming agreement with South Sea and Telcom, the number three and number four. Thank you. I'll take Sami Dovona and then I'll take Graphic. We take two questions so it doesn't get complicated. Thank you. 
Charles Benoni, okay, daily graphic. So I mean, starting with uh, you know with the first question, the transition of the company. Um, I think what you will see is that we, and, and I said this I think in some of my comments earlier. You know, we see the company remaining uh, invested in the core connectivity for a very long time. I'm excited about the opportunities that are there in the core business, the core telco business, um, providing voice data services to consumers and enterprises. The enterprise area is one that I'm, I'm super excited about uh, in terms of to be able to provide for SMMEs and large enterprises and the role of 5G edge technologies going forward. So I think you will see us continuing to invest in the core connectivity business. And um, you know, uh, you know, unless you know, Salom wants to tell me something new, we're not gonna shrink ourselves out of that business. We're gonna grow into that business. But what you'll see is that the services that sit on top of that connectivity uh, is the point that we're accentuating with Ambition 2025, where we're basically saying that on top of that connectivity are things like financial services, digital apps, our instant messaging platform, network as a service is, is, is sitting on top of that, uh, uh, an API marketplace. Uh, why do we need API marketplace created in another part of the world? We can create it here in Africa. So what we are saying is that you will see these businesses potentially being standalone in of themselves over a period of time, not necessarily today. So no layoffs. We see uh, you know tremendous opportunity for growth. On the 4G point, I mean you know for sure we want to push um, um, 4G coverage uh, you know deep into the rural areas. I don't know right now what the exact sp specifics of our 4G population coverage may be. Salom can stand up and tell you, but. 90? 91%. 91%. So we've got 9% to, and that's actually r very high relative to the other markets we operate in. So the 4G pop coverage, we, start, we just got to get that last mile, which is the last 9%. Um, so look, I mean, we are very conscious that we can't leave anybody behind. So that 9% needs relative closing. But I, I do want to commend where Salom is, because when I first got involved with this business, uh, we're talking about 4G pop coverage. Uh, at that stage, which was, um, and this is 2018, when I joined the board of MTA in Ghana, um, I think the, the pop coverage then was you know, way below 50. So a lot of progress made in a very short time. Thank you. Let me take Jifab Bampo of 3FM TV3 and Vivian of City, two ladies. Thank you. My name is Jifab Bampo. I'm the CEO of I'd like to ask about MTN's investment in areas of tourism. So if, as you say, that you're committed to our development and that Ghana is one of the jewels in your crown, I've traveled to significant tourist areas where coverage is, pardon my saying, it leaves much to be desired. 
If we care so much about growing a country, tourism is one of those moving parts. And I would like to know what the plans are for such significant investment, such that the kind of good coverage that you get in a place like Accra mm. will be available in the Volta region, in the Western region, in the Northern region, in the Central region. Thank you. Thank you. Vivian. Okay, um, two quick questions. Um, my name is Vivian Kai Look, I work with City FM and City TV. The stabilization levy has been with us for a while. The plan initially was it to be a temporary tax, but we find government continuously rolling it over. What has been the impact on your business, and is it time for you to say, hey, government, we've had enough, hold on with that tax? And then the second one, um, your share price from May to April, we've seen a marginal decrease on the, the share price. Um, some industry players believe the e-levy contributed to that, among other factors. But what are your plans to make shareholders happy to ensure that till the end of the year we don't see further decline and it does better. Thank you. No, thank you for those great questions. Um, I mean, the tourism one is a very interesting one because, you know, the benefit of the moves here is different markets. And even in South Africa, where some people refer to as our home markets, when you go to any reserve, you always have poor reception. Sometimes we even have like 3G. <laughs> <laughs> and it's often because of the fact that Seriously? We are meeting their needs, but on a more serious note, I mean, uh, if, if, we, if the tourism um, parts of the country are part of the 9% that we haven't fully covered, then we must know that we have plans to get to as close as possible to 100% uh, population uh, coverage and we'll get to deal uh, with that. And so long as I, I saw him mentally taking notes. So you, I, I think you should see progress. In a year's time, you can ask me the same question. Hopefully, we've seen some progress there. I mean, on the point about stabilization levies, I mean, I, I, I won't be specific to your question, but rather answer it in a more generic way, which is um, because we've seen, you know, kind of macro shocks globally, governments that are trying to create some sort of fiscal st stabilization um, are continuing with programs that they thought were short term. It's not only a Ghana effect. You go to Nigeria, you have the same issue. You go to South Africa, same. We are being impacted by global shocks that you know, transmit maybe slightly differently in each country, but the thematic is that it's putting a lot of pressure fiscally uh, on countries and either with monetary uh, responses or fiscally, some things have had to be sustained. And we may not like it as individuals, but you know, things are being done within the concept uh, of burning share. On the share price, I mean, we can't give you a guarantee the share price won't go down. What we can give you a guarantee is that we will do our best to deliver shareholder value through the medium term guidance that we are, um, you know, have committed to shareholders. Uh, and his medium term guidance, Salomia, is high teen service revenue growth. So if he doesn't deliver that, then you have a problem with him. But the share price is driven by all sorts of factors. And I'll argue that the, the two biggest ones that are driving it are the following. Um, there is a, a, a global sell-off of emerging markets. Mm -hmm. I see it in the group share price. Mm -hmm. the, group share, the group is doing well, mm -hmm. but the share price is coming down. Yep. So there are big portfolio investors, particularly in developed markets, yep. who are just selling emerging markets. Yes. Uh, indiscriminately. Yes. They're not looking at quality stocks or yeah. bad stock. They just say it's a sell. There's a sell yeah. decision. The second is dollar strength. Mm. Is as a consequence of the Ukraine-Russia crisis, is there's, a, there's a flight to safety which goes to the dollar. So investors, again, are being indiscriminate. So, I mean, for sure, it pains so long, it pains me to see the share price coming. But if I stress about that more than I stress about rolling out networks, I'm, doing my, I'm not doing my job. Mm. Um, but, you know, you know, shareholders, you know, ultimately understand value. Mm -hmm. And what might be short term now, I think we'll see the share price recovered to reflect its fair okay. valuation. We will take the last two questions, the gentleman and then Toma. Yes, so you first. Sir. Uh, to say, 
Is there a possibility of reducing the cost of aircraft, the cost of data for your customers who are really struggling under the same macroeconomic conditions in this country? Thank you. To Mr. Mandarin, I present Coast Street Business Online, a corporate guide in magazine. Thank you. Um, Officials going up, preserve the cost of Africa. Um, interest rates are rising. Are you considering, are you seeing a lot of increase of complex expenditure? So, um, are you looking at adjusting the mode of your financing from debt towards equity? And specifically to Ghana, mm -hmm. um, we did an, an, an IPO some years ago. So the largest Ghana ever on the stock market. Mm. What you took off the market was also the largest ever, mm. but it still fell about, well, more than it's very much part of what you want to get. Are you, would you consider another stock market issue mm. here? So if the prices pick up, mm. would you consider another stock market issue here mm. to raise money rather than debt? Yeah, two great questions. All the questions have been great, and I really want to thank each and every one of you for your contributions here. I mean, on the point around um, you know the pressure that the consumer is facing, I mean, we also all consumers, so we're very sensitive to that. And um, you know, we watch. Uh, I think I mentioned it earlier. The effective rate uh, per gigabyte that we sell data for, and we all we've been seeing it falling, um, and it's falling. Uh, faster uh, than inflation, actually. So, I mean, it's one way of giving back. I think to your point around, you know, we make profits, I mean, but we also pay a lot of tax. So I think this economic um, value that we generate through the work we do, uh, we give quite a substantial of that back to society uh, through the taxes that we pay, and we pay a myriad of taxes. And I do want to thank uh, Salom and his team for ensuring that we remain, you know, highly tax compliant and uh, being the largest contributor, as far as I know personally, and maybe I need to be corrected, you know, of taxes uh, within the country. I mean, on the point around debt equity, I mean, we're very cognizant of that. I think this business in Ghana, it's a prepaid business, it's highly cash generative. So we don't really need a lot of debt to run the company. We take on debt to have the right capital structure to, to improve the return profile of the company. But debt is not something that we deeply depend on uh, to run uh, the business. Uh, to your point around the IPO, you know, we successfully IPO'd um, and had, um, you know, gain, get a participation of about 12.5% in 2018, if I remember correctly. I think I was here for the IPO itself and the celebrations that go to it. But we've committed as the MTN group to further localize and have more Ghanaians owning the shares of MTN Ghana and that we want to get to at least 30. So the 30 is the target that we have uh, committed to. Um, I'm very pleased to say we've made progress. We're now at um, uh, precisely 23.7%. Uh, so we've got another 6.7% of shares to localize. Um, and the reason we want that is we want more and more Ghanaians to enjoy and participate in the economic success of Ghanaians. Um, you know, over time because they are also the consumers. So that program of further localization remains intact and all things going well, we are targeting to get to that 30%, you know, no, no later than the end of the year. There are always market conditions that may affect us, but, you know, we are going to try and get to that 30% localization um, because we think, uh, you know, more and more Ghanaians, individuals and institutions should own uh, this quality asset um, and uh, drive deeper liquidity in the local market so that the stock price can go up. Liquidity is obviously a function, and we are very alive to the fact of the, what the MTN Ghana share does on the Ghanaian Stock Exchange. Thank you very much, colleagues. I, I want to wrap up with a final question. And I think when you made reference to the Western portfolio investors just selling, mm -hmm took my mind back to a discussion we had in Ghanaian media about how the global global finance mm. is not very fair to Africa. Mm. Give you a couple of examples. So rating agencies, mm. they, they really have a, a narrow view of the continent. Mm. So a country like Ghana, 30 years stable democracy, 
the risk premium they place on debt to Ghana mm. is different from countries in Asia and Europe mm. who have worse democratic credentials. Mm. So there's a view that capital is very cultural and ethnic, and we have to support the growth of a new capital class in Africa, build our own rating agencies, change the narrative so we can help develop the continent, not just make profit. Mm. You have you 720 something million customers. You are a very large company. 276. 276. 276. 276. 276. 270. So you are bigger than many countries. Yeah. You are in over 20 countries. Do you take the responsibility as MTN to help in that effort? Mm. Because it's not just making profit and making your shareholders happy. It's about helping to develop the continent. Mm. We are mostly commodity exporters. And if we have to develop, we can't be exporting things raw. Mm. My question to you is beyond helping MTN become a great business, do you see a responsibility behold on you, not you as a person, but as a company, in leading a new capital class, changing the global conversation on the continent? If so, what kind of realistic commitments can you make in that regard? It's a great set of questions, and uh, it's at the core of what we believe uh, at MTN. I mean, I, I raised the point early on that we see ourselves um, as a pan-African business. We are exiting the Middle East over the medium term. Uh, we've made some exits and committing ourselves wholly to the African continent. So Africa is home for us. We are not uh, are going anywhere else. And so we have to make it work at home. So the, 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 the economic conditions are very tough at the moment. And, and, and hence, uh, you know, we are on these stakeholder trips to really understand so we can be part of the solution rather than the problem. So we start with a view, and which I want to correct and make sure that it's correctly framed, is we see our role over time as driving digital and financial inclusion. And I often add to that, and uh, my colleagues often say, to give our people dignity and hope. That's what we do at MTN, mm. to drive digital and financial inclusion to give our people dignity and hope. And that's a long-term goal. So when we see short-term or medium-term challenges around investment, as I said, we're staying invested. The, the, the plans that we saw for CapEx investment in Ghana, we are committed to those. Not, not despite the challenges. Um, so to your point, I'm also sure we need a new uh, kind of um, class, but what we, we need are people and corporates that are committed to the development of this continent, knowing that we are gonna get this through all of this. And I think the, 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 the three C's that you've raised, you know, uh, COVID, the conflict, climate change, should get us all as Africans, because I, I don't think one African country will solve it by itself. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not strong. But the African continent as a collective is extraordinarily powerful. The human capital, the land that we have, the potential uh, of our people. And you need, dare I say, you know, companies like MTN that are saying we are committed to driving and, and, and finding the solutions. Because as you say, if you, if you depend on portfolio investment, mm -hmm you are at the vagaries yeah. of the changes in economic and, uh, view, uh, um, and, and, and different views. And that is very dangerous. You need long-term capital, you need committed capital, and long-term and committed capital is what MTN Group is on the African continent. I think a round of applause is not bad. <laughs> Thank you, Ralph for allowing us to ask you questions Appreciate it. without uh, going through any sifting. Yeah. I think it's good to invite Selom. Selom is the one we've been pestering here. So we're going to bring him to close us and then tell us the way forward. So uh, please bring the mic back to Selom. Put your hands together for Selom. Bernard for moderating this session so expertly. But of course, we couldn't do that without your participation and your contribution to the questions and everything else. I want to say a big thank you to all of you for coming. And first of all, I apologize on behalf of MTN for the changes we made to the schedule. But you've all been most gracious and we're grateful that you can still make it despite the change. And to say thank you to everyone, thank you to Ralph for his time and for his insights. 
and lots in there that we have to unpack and think about. But I do think we need here with a lot more knowledge than we can get, and a lot that can inspire us the way that we think about the continent and about what everything can do in support of our development forward. So thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How was that? Much appreciated.